to leverage AI in retail transformation. How to leverage AI in re retail transformation. We have the privilege and the honor of working with our co-founder CTO of Marvic, our customer partner, Rodrigo Becero, and he will be talking with Carl Lewis. A little housekeeping. This is a recorded session. And if you have any questions, please ensure you drop those questions in the Q&A so we can make sure we accurately follow them. I will be dropping messages in chat just to encourage people. Um, and if you, we will have a live Q&A. Carl will walk through the agenda. And we will send out follow-up emails tomorrow with a recording of this session. Thank you again for joining us. With that, I'm going on silence. Carl, take it away. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, excited to uh, present this webinar today with uh, Rodrigo. Um, as Adrian said, our partner uh, at Mavic. Um, so I'm responsible for partnerships at Landing. Um, I've been with the company now for two years, uh, coming up to 30 years experience of uh, working on computer vision projects and in different uh, industries, but today we're going to be talking about how uh, the retail industry is being transformed uh, with computer vision and AI. Uh, so the agenda we have today is as follows. We're going to do a quick introduction of landing uh, AI and also Mavic, uh, how we work together, uh, why we form the partnership, um, we'll be talking about how computer vision and AI is transforming retail and it's happened as we speak. Um, and part of that, some of the challenges that, uh, you know, we're helping solve are, are products being placed correctly on retail shelves, uh, working uh, to identify out of stock items, and then also answering the question of price, items priced correctly. And we do this by capturing images, either with a cell phone or fixed cameras or with robots. Uh, working through the previous approach, the limitations with that very manual process, um, we'll detail how to get started on an application, um, like the one that uh, you know we'll, we'll go through during the session uh, and some of the results that we had achieved um, with the specific use case that we will uh, go through. Uh, we'll also be looking at other use cases and uh, some other technologies. And then at the end, there'll be some time for uh, Q&A. Okay, so a little bit about the partnership, um, why we uh, decided to come together and bring our teams together. Um, when I started with Landing, um, I was asked to build the partnership program from, from ground up. And what I wanted to do was make sure that we partnered with um, companies that enabled us to get close to our customer, build that customer intimacy, but also be able to bring in some of their focus competencies to augment ours. So as an example for uh, Mavic, they have four focus competencies that they um, that they work on. One is computer vision. Uh, another is uh, NLP, natural language processing, predictive analysis, and end-to-end -end machine learning. So what you'll see during this session is that, yes, for the retail uh, use cases, it is a classic computer vision problem that we're trying to solve. We're, we're taking images, we're building models, but there's more to it than that. It's um, you know, taking the image, it's comparing the details in the image um, to a database, then, then providing analytics um, to provide, uh, you know, a next step for, for the retailer. Um, so if you look at Landing AI, our competency is with our computer vision uh, platform, Landing Lens. Easy to use, get started quickly. We provide really accurate results and, and we can do it quickly. Also, flexible deployment options, which provide scalability. So when we partnered with Mavic, Mavic wanted to standardize on a platform that enabled them to solve customers' problems quickly, 
and go from prototyping to deployment as fast as possible to unlock that uh, value at, at the customer. So bringing those competencies together, we can provide a, a great uh, mix for customers to solve problems um, and unlock that value in, in an effective and efficient manner. Okay, so a little bit more on Landing AI. Um, so I mentioned that we have a platform. So our software makes computer vision really easy. Um, and our goal uh, is to build computer vision AI models quickly and easily, irrespective of your background. So you don't need to be a data scientist. Uh, you don't need to be a machine learning engineer. Um, you can get going very quickly. And we've done this across a number of industries, um, retail being one, and we've done this um, within manufacturing as well. But we want customers to unlock the potential and value of AI and, and move those projects from proof of concept to production uh, very quickly. So our platform enables you to do this. You can upload images, you can label, you can train and deploy which means that our customers um, get ease of use right out of the box, able to um, achieve accurate results uh, in a fast manner. And we have flexible deployment options, like I mentioned, cloud APIs um, on edge devices. You can also download models as well, which provides unlimited scalability for our customers. So how it works, uh, we're a cloud-based platform so this provides customers the scalability that I mentioned before. It allows you to upload images to our platform, label those images, press a train button, which creates a model, and then you're ready to predict. You can either use an API, or you can bring the model down to an edge device, or you can download the model and put it in your own um, infrastructure. Okay, so that's a little bit of an intro into uh, why we partnered with Mavic and uh, the competencies that we that we uh, brought together. Now I'd like to have Rodrigo go into the more specifics of the retail use case that um, we outlined at the start of the session. Thank you very much, Carl. And let me try to share my screen and please let me know once you can actually see this. Yes, can see yep. the screen now. Perfect, perfect. So as Carl was actually introducing, um, AI is solving a lot of problems. Computer vision is solving a lot of problems. Retail is not the exception for that. What we'll try to do today is try to take a real world application and try to share that knowledge, that experience with Facer, hoping that it's useful for you and happy to help if you need any additional uh, assistance with landing lens with these retail applications or whatever. Uh, a bit more context on Marvic, as Carl was saying, uh, we do the end-to-end -end in the AI space. We like to impact on businesses. Uh, we tackle many different projects that range from healthcare and mining to this um, in retail. And what we'll be talking today is the shelf, shelf detection. This is a huge problem for many retailers. Here we actually need to detect, um, detect the bounding boxes of all of the items in the shelf, classify them, imagine the millions of different SKUs. And the SKU is basically an item. Um, we can get into those details in a few seconds. We want to basically identify and count all of them, the, sh the supermarket shelves. And some of the challenges that this actually presents is that, first of all, this huge number of products. Then the nature of the business makes that they change the packaging a lot. And changing the packaging basically means changing the labels that we need. You need to respond to that in really not too much time. That's a huge issue because we need to restrain models. That's really not that easy to do. Um, we also like to build scalable solutions that we can deploy anywhere in the world. 
there are many different packages all around the world. If you buy a Coke or a Pepsi or whatever you like uh, in China, it's not the same as buying that in the US or France or Brazil. So we need to account for that. And some of the other challenges is actually capturing all of the necessary information in a single frame. Computer vision, it's easier to process a single frame. We try to do that, we get into the details. We like to have as much pixels as possible. That's a higher resolution. So to have more information on each of the items, we need to classify. Um, but at the same time, this needs to be feasible from the technical point of view. Um, and the idea is to basically walk you through what we did, try to share some of the knowledge, try to present alternatives if you are facing a similar problem. And happy to discuss that. As Carl was saying, we'll have a QA and a at the end, but feel free to start asking questions through the chat. Um, any of these computer vision problems, uh, whenever we have a new client that has a problem definition like this one, we always start by doing an EDA or exploratory data analysis. That's basically gaining more information of, on, of the problem, of the data, distribution biases, stuff like that. Then we need to build a data set. Um, it's really important to understand what data set you need to build, exactly how. Um, we can discuss that in more detail. We'll benchmark different algorithms. Uh, this can be solved by object protection, class classification. This can be solved by image segmentation or instance segmentation being a bit more accurate uh, and, or many other stuff. What model will exactly be using? We'll basically take the model champion that we call and uh, the winner from that benchmarking and we'll try to fine tune that, try to get the best results. And once we have a model, we need to build an end-to-end -end pipeline. And that's something that's easy to underestimate. There are many challenges to actually deploying this to production. Once you have a model that perhaps it's running in a notebook or whatever you guys like, uh, we need to do a, a bunch more things. Um, and then, of course, the scaling and retraining. We have POC or we have an MVP, we need to scale that. And once we have solved this problem, there are additional problems uh, in the retail space that we can tackle really easily uh, from that starting point. And you might be a bit more technical, you might be a bit more from the business side. Uh, your takeaway from this is that when you, when you start a new problem, you have really particular data. That's not something that you can actually on many occasions uh, extrapolate from other problems. So your reality will be just yours. You need to really, really understand what you need to label. And this comes from a business definition. So I need, uh, I'm going to take Coke as an example, um, say Pepsi or say whatever you guys like, Dr. Pepper, it's the same. Um, you need to, for example, understand if all of the Cokes are just going to be Coke or regular Coke, it's going to be different from Diet Coke. If the different volumes of um, of liquid can, are also mapped to the same class, understanding all of that it's really important. You need to, in a way, automate part of this because if you are doing things correctly, you might have a huge data set, um, and that's not easy to do and can be really time consuming. And some important things: um, a class doesn't necessarily mean an item, um, so. When we faced this problem, we found that many packages were really, really alike. So let's take examples of products that actually compete, that one's mimicking the other's packaging. It can be really easy uh, confuse one with the other, even for a human. So on occasions, we actually map a class to multiple products, even if they're actually from the competition. And then we use cascading classifiers to reduce the confusion or try to limit that. So basically we detect red items and among the red items, we understand if they're product A or product B. I'm not sure if this makes sense. Um, a huge warning with this, this can introduce biases to overrepresented classes. Uh, we need to take all of this into account. And as I was actually saying in the example, an SKU doesn't necessarily mean a class. Uh, these two images are basically the same. If I don't tell you the proportions of these images, you'll basically confuse them. Remember that we're actually scaling the images when inputting those to the model models, um, as Carl was just 
showing with landing lens. So the model might just receive this image and it's really, really hard to actually tell these two apart. Uh, you need to read the volume on the uh, bottom right of the of the label and that's on occasions not that easy to do. And this is how a real world image actually looks like for this problem. So once you, you have a problem definition, you did some exploration on the data, you gained some understanding, some insights on that, you need to build the data set. And on any problem that you face in this space, you'll try to most likely look for publicly available data sets. Good news on this problem is that there, there are some publicly available data sets that we can use that are really, really relevant. This image is actually taken from that data set. Uh, but problem, uh, commercial license. Uh, so you need to be sure that your application actually complies with whatever we're actually trying to, to use to build this. This also goes for the models, any pre-gen models that you might want to use. Um, Picking a local data set, local means adapted to your specific geography. Remember the example of China labels not being the same as France labels. Uh, it's really not that easy. It's really not fast because even if you go to all of the supermarkets nearby, on occasions you need to take multiple pictures of basically just products presented in different ways with new items. And that uh, process can actually take weeks. And building a, let's call it an international data set for this problem is really, really hard because you need people on site. It's really not that easy to accomplish. And that's something to take into account when scaling a solution like this. Um, an important point, um, how you're going to take the pictures actually changes uh, what types of algorithms at the end-to-end -end pipeline that you need to build. Uh, there are some solutions, I'm just taking this uh, from the news, where you can actually use robots to actually capture this. Um, remember that however you do this, you build this data set and you automate this in production. It needs to be scalable. It doesn't work if you train with images from a human and extrapolate those to a robot, not off the shelf at least most likely, or vice versa. In our particular case, we actually use it uh, humans with a cell phones. Uh, you could also try to use that cameras on the shelves or in the store, or basically it's autonomous vehicles to try to capture the images. Everything that we're going to say today basically applies to all of these scenarios. And just a bit more context, remember that we're actually uh, using supervised learning. So that's learning from data we know the answers to. That means that we need label data. And I always like to use this example for that where we have a dog and a cat. Let's say, let's suppose that we need to draw the bounding boxes as Carl was saying at the beginning of all of this uh, to try to uh, find this dog and cat in the image. So remember that we have a human labeling the, the images with the, those labeled images will uh, most likely scale that to more images to a larger data set. That's where tools like Landing Lens comes in. And with that, we train the models. Uh, if you have a mistake on this, it's then the model is going to uh, learn the incorrect patterns, and that's an issue. And an easy way of actually drawing these model boxes is something like this in the example. But th then there's a huge, um, huge biases and you need to actually make explicit decisions on this. All of these blue bounding boxes actually contain the dog. And depending, depending on the pattern that you're actually looking to find, perhaps the face is good enough to count the dogs in the image. And then you need to just label the, the faces of the dogs or the entire body uh, or the larger bounding boxes because there you actually contain part, all of the dog, but you also contain part of the cat as well. So that's an issue and you need to take um, into account that. Um, once you have decided on how to label the data, you need to design the algorithm. And I, as I was just explaining, we we can do we can treat this as an object detection and image classification problem, or as an instance segmentation problem. Um, basically, the differences are that in the first one, you can actually just look for the bounding boxes, and you're going to train a first model to basically draw bounding boxes uh, around the items and you don't care the class about that item. 
And then once you have that bounding box, you just basically try to classify into the n amount of classes that you have. And this is good because the object detection uh, approach can actually be scalable to new SKUs. So your business is always selling new product, then you can actually reuse this. And you can actually name down the image classification problem to just training for the new classes. That's one way of taking a look at this. Or you can try to uh, tackle this as an instance segmentation problem. Segmentation means pixel by pixel, bounding boxes or the object detection means that you can actually be a little bit less accurate. Um, there's also an advantage of actually going with the bounding boxes is that it's faster to actually label this. When you actually are labeling this um, pixel by pixel, that takes a huge amount of time. Regardless of the approach you take for designing this algorithm, you'll finally try to on occasions need the shelf detection. This is basically about detection and we'll explain that why we need that in a few seconds. And then you'll most likely like to improve the, the accuracy, the performance of the model, the recall as you want to call it. Um, this actually depends on your goal with all of this. So we, you need to correct errors so as to improve the overall performance of the system. There are many components to this, many decisions. It's really, it's really not easy to make some of these decisions without actually experimenting first. And there are some things like segmentation thing. You'll most likely be taking a look at this if you want to, um, if you want to solve a similar problem. This it's a model that you can actually download. It's commercially available. So there's a lot of advantages of using this, but there's some trade-off. In our particular case, we actually went for a different approach because this didn't solve all of the problems and also wasn't available at the time. Um, and then we have tools like Landing Lens. I'm going to stop here for a second. Um, the huge advantage of using a tool like this, um, for those of you who are not familiar, is that you can upload here your data set. You can just label a few images and the tool itself by training the models in background, so this is quite transparent for many of us, uh, can actually um, find new bounding boxes, find new classes, can extrapolate, can learn really easily, really fast. A uh, huge advantage if you're actually running an organization and your team is not too knowledgeable about uh, the best model that you can actually use here is that you can actually offload some of those decisions to this tool. Uh, with this, you'll have your trained model, uh, as Carl was also explaining. You can use that as an endpoint. You can also download that model and deploy that and connect that with your pipeline. Let's go with the robot example. Uh, you can actually use this on edge computing to try to or install um, with an on-premise server or you can deploy this to your own cloud. So you can um, have a lot of flexibility with this. And also um, as a user of this tool, this tool is also evolving really, really fast. There's new features uh, all of the time. So if you use this, you might get some advantages without actually needing to work more for all of this. Um, and then diving deeper into how these models work. So we are a company that works on these models really at a low, low level. So we implement th things like connect with tools like Landing Lens, but on many other problems, we also need to do the, that work ourselves. And we'll most likely be using PNNs or convolutional neural networks. And for you, those of you who are not familiar with them, this is basically the part of the of deep learning of AI that actually works with images. And works with images means working with pixels. And one of the really important decisions, I was mentioning this at the beginning, is what's the resolution we have for uh, these images? So if we have a huge shelf, uh, imagine large supermarkets, then we most likely have a, a little amount of pixels per SKU. Uh, you're not going to take a thousand images of the entire shelf. You're most likely going to try to take just one, try to cover many, many items. Otherwise it's too time consuming. And you need to decide that because you're most likely be going to 
be working with a low resolution image, something like this handwritten eight that we're actually seeing here. Um, there's a trade-off between the quality of the image, how many of them you actually need to take to cover an entire shelf. That's something not easy to solve. And if you're not too knowledgeable about how this works, we're be going to be basically looking for patterns, patterns like this in the image. So let's suppose I'm not looking for a Coke, I'm looking for a house, and I see that in this image. Uh, the CNNs are the type of deep neural networks that are going to be looking for the ceiling, that's diagonals, then these uh, vertical lines that are actually the walls, and combining all of that, uh, we're going to draw conclusions if this is uh, a house or it's not a house. Taking that to our retail example, we need to look at the classes that we label. We need to understand that uh, a, ne a neural network can actually tell these classes apart. Uh, we need enough information, enough signal in that. Uh, are we looking just at color, for example, to try to tell those apart? Uh, that actually helps us answer if we need a single classifier, multiple classifiers, or stuff like that. And I'm going to make a quick pause here and go over some of the questions in the Q&A. Uh, feel free to actually post more if you like. Um, we'll share the link of the webinar, yes, um, that's not a problem. And the output of the system going to be which item is now out of stock, yes. And for that, we need to understand which were actually in stock and also know which ones you expect from there. And we're going to cover the empty spaces in a, in a short while as well. Um, this might be a bit too technical. Don't worry if you don't get this, but just take away from this is that there are some models that are really, really good at finding different classes based on the color. And you can try to leverage them if you guys like. This is basically how this works. You can actually try to cluster this. Remember, on occasions we're talking about five pixels by five pixels on some of the images which try to understand this. So color is a huge hint. If you have um, a really fast moving uh, stock, so if you're changing products really, really fast, you might not have enough training data. That's a problem and you need to solve that. From the technical point of view for the business, somehow you need to solve that. And Siamese networks are actually a good way of doing that. They're, these are also based on these convolutional neural networks. You basically compare similar images. So the advantage from this is that with just a few examples of an image, this is, can also be connected to few shot learning. That's another way of solving this problem. Is that you don't need a huge training data set to, so as to find new, new images. You just compare the new images that you have in your catalog today to the cutouts of this uh, shelf that you actually get with the bounding boxes. And you have a way of actually trying to, without retraining the model every time, that can be a bit too expensive on the compute side as well. Uh, you can actually try to find those images. And then you can try to go, uh, sorry, this title is updated. You can actually try to also leverage uh, additional information that you can actually have in the images. You can, for example, try to do some local detection or OCR and try to detect that. In this example, uh, this is just from the website. We're actually not showing any client images here, but you can see the Goffy on the, on the right and uh, the blue bounding box, the sky blue bounding box, that it's really hard to actually do OCR on that. It's likely that you'll not get much from that. But regardless of that, you can actually uh, find the logo. So, and humans can actually find that and can read that. Computers might be a bit more tricky. Um, so please take all of this into account. Um, you need to take into account when you have small variations in these products. So um, if you're actually looking at different variations of Hershey chocolates, probably you're just going to find the Hershey name really, really big. And it's going to be hard to actually find something that actually tells those apart. With the yogurt that you actually have there, the Danone uh, you have there, that's Morango. I, uh, that's basically a strawberry. Uh, if you actually change the flavor, you're most likely going to be facing a really, really similar pattern there. Um, also complementing that example here, these different shampoos, 
here you're most likely just going to be able to read head and shoulders in a best case scenario, depending on the image. The packaging is the same. The colors are really, really similar because you can actually tell those apart being a human in these close-ups. But in some of the real world images that we we need to face, it's really hard to detect this. We don't basically we don't have enough pixels to find the signal. Um, and we have new questions. I'm going to try to answer those. We'll have time for those at the end anyway. How how easy is it to set up a useful data set for detected products in shell? Especially when you might not always get the item in the correct position. It's really hard, it's really expensive. You need to go to supermarkets to take pictures. It's not easy to get that. Um, and perhaps the brands can actually show you images of the packaging, but that's not something that you'll face in the real world. So that image only gets you to a certain point. Um, some items could be on the side, yes. And that's why you actually need real world images because you want to classify those correctly anyway. And how do you count items placed behind the front row? Uh, it's really not easy. To you can do that. Um, if you don't see those items, we have 2D images. We can only uh, count things that we see. If they're actually hidden or occluded, you can't. Uh, there's some partial occlusions on some of the items. And with that, you can do something. You can try to count them. But otherwise, it's really, really hard. Um, and how will you address if you need to identify a product from top view and the leads are almost the same? Is there a way to do that? Again, with label data. If you have enough information in the label data to find that, then the, the CNNs, for example, might be able to do that. Uh, on occasions, uh, if a human can tell this apart, then a computer can tell this apart. Uh, but you need enough information. I'm going to keep on going and we can get get back to these questions in a few minutes. We have a lot of time for a Q&A. Um, so imagine yourself at a large supermarket, large shelf, on occasions many meters, uh, many feet of shelf. Um, it's most likely that you're not going to be able to capture all of that information in a single image. Regardless of that, you'll need to basically count the entire shelf so as to get a really good understanding of the problem there. And then you actually need to do things like this, that we're actually assuming this is just an illustrative image from this, but you need to do some stitching for that. And there are many, many problems. If you do this with a robot, you actually might actually avoid many of this because the height of the camera might always be the same. The angle of the camera might always be the same. But if you have a human take this picture, then we're going to have slight different, different angles from one picture to the other. And those errors tend to accumulate as you take more and more pictures. And so here is where we actually see the trade-off between actually taking more pictures that might mean higher resolution and more information for uh, detecting the, the classes. The trade-off is that it's a harder word to actually stitch this together. And just to illustrate this with an example or try to explain how we're actually doing this, we're using algorithms like Surf, Orbit, or stuff like that. Some were actually really recently released for commercial use and have really good results. We're looking for key points in images that are actually close by and trying to match them to the image on the, on the left or on the right, top or bottom. Um, remember the key points, this is important because if you have, let's suppose, uh, an aisle with many, many shampoos, for example, then one shampoo is most likely identical to the, the one on the on the right and the one on the left. And you need to be basically telling, the, uh, be able to tell those apart. Otherwise you stitch the image in the incorrect place and you might have missing items or duplicated items. I'm not sure if you're actually imagining the situation, it's really easy to make that mistake. And um, perhaps this image actually helps illustrate this. Um, with this, it's really hard. Let's only look at, take a look at a column. Let's, I'm not sure if you actually see my pointer, but here on the left image, you have 
a missing space in the third row from the bottom. And you have products that are actually really, really alike. Let's suppose that you got the image by half there. It's really, really hard to say if you're actually duplicating that or if that's actually different products. And this is how in real world this stitching actually looks like, right? Um, good news, many models being released lately. There's a lot of, of hype in all of this. There's some really state-of-the-art uh, trackers that you can also try to use, especially if you're looking at solving these problems with videos and not just photographs, because that's an alternative. You can use stuff like Go Tracker by Meta. Uh, this was released really recently. This is just to showcase the capabilities here. We're actually tracking the key points. Key points are basically the colors that you're actually seeing on the horse and the rider. And tracking those over over the different frames can actually give you a really good idea if you're actually taking a look at new information or old information. Um, and this is also a real world example of this teaching going not that perfect. Uh, here we're actually making some mistakes on the, on the key point. And here on the bottom, there's some workarounds to solve this where we basically delete the part of the image that we see duplicated. And with that, we can actually uh, get much more, much less errors in the end-to-end -end pipeline. And here, uh, if you're actually seeing, you have some angles in the, in the black spaces. That's because of the change in the perspective uh, of the human actually taking the picture. And you might see some images like the one that I'm actually showing my pointer right now, where you actually have some some part of, of the floor and the, the ceiling as well, that's part of the image that wasn't taken in the previous picture. These are the mistakes that you avoid uh, if you're actually using a robot for this. Um, then continuing with the, all of this, um, we need to understand the ROI, that's the region of interest, that's where we actually need to look. And if you're looking for spe specific categories, you might want to delete some others that might actually help you uh, reduce the error. So let's suppose we're actually only looking for dog food in this, in this example. Uh, let's suppose that here in the middle, we know that we have cat food, then we perhaps want to avoid that because the packaging might be too similar. And this actually depends on the context. This depends on the problem definition that can be untied from the technical solution. And I mentioned something about error correction uh, at the beginning of this presentation. Um, you're going to make mistakes solving this problem. This is never going to be 100% accurate. Even if you have humans counting this, they only make different mistakes, but mistakes at the end of the day counting, you try to minimize them uh, when trying to solve this problem. Here, one of the things you can try to do is to try to use the information from the neighboring items. That's basically, if I'm not too confident on this item being X and the item on my left and the item on my right are actually of a specific class or a specific SKU, then it actually increases the likelihood of me being from that same class. So that's something that you can try to use. And then you can actually use some fallback mechanisms as I was saying, the OCR can be really, really good at that. And then we get to these missing items. So once we solve this problem, there are many other problems we can try to solve. And um, once we have a solution that's good enough to count, detect the brands, the SKUs, and in these images from the shelf, from the supermarket, you can try to uh, find the missing items. And this black bounding box that you're actually seeing, uh, that's a missing item that we're actually seeing in production. This is a real world image and it's completely anonymized. Here, uh, what we're actually using is the dimensions of the items on the left and on the right to try to see if we have enough space. If you're actually looking at a real world supermarket, you have different with you have items with different proportions. This is basically different width, for example. And if it's a, if you're actually looking at a product that's incorrectly placed, and you're only looking at the side of the product, that might be a problem, and you can actually confuse the algorithm. So you need to take into account the average width of the row of the eye that you're actually taking a look at. 
uh, so as to find those missing items. And this is basically just information that you draw from the bounding boxes. This is an advantage of using the object detection approach versus the instance segmentation I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and it also an important thing to mention with this, it's, it can even be subjective to the human when you're actually trying to label this, if you have enough space there to actually put another item. In this particular case, you might even have doubts if there's enough space there to actually put another item or if it's basically not enough and you just need to actually accommodate the shelf a bit differently. Um, Lastly, uh, one of the main problems in all of this is the planogram compliance. This is basically the brands actually agree with the supermarkets on how they need to display the items. So you'll most likely have the lower volume in the drinks on top, the larger volume at the bottom, and things like that. Uh, you need to actually um, tell the algorithm what you expect from this um, distribution of the different classes of the different items to be. And that's something that's even really hard to define because you want the same rules to apply. Even if we have, for example, three rows or five rows or eight rows, depending on the on how tall the shelves are at the supermarket. If it's a huge supermarket, it'll most likely have multiple items, one close to the other that are exactly the same. But that's incorrect if your supermarket is a bit slower, you don't have uh, enough space to display that. And instead of having five consecutive items that are exactly the same, perhaps you want just two. There are many other rules, for example, uh, avoiding discontinued products, uh, products with correct pricing. You can try to beat price tags as well with all of this. If you have enough resolution in the image, that's something not that easy to do. Um, there are many challenges because different countries actually present pricing, discounts, and stuff like that differently. Um, so there are many, many caveats to that as well. Um, and as a takeaway from this, this is something that a human can really, really easily do, say if you're actually complying with the planogram, because there are many implicit rules that it's really, really hard to teach to the computer. And you need to have clear rules so as to define an algorithm that can actually be followed and can actually be scalable for this. And different number of shelf or space in each shelf, those are basically both or the columns, if you're actually imagining the bounding boxes here, that can actually make a huge difference. We don't have much time left, so I'm going to be going really fast over this. Hardware and deployment, there are many options to doing this that range from having everything on the cloud and you just connect the cameras to that. This means a huge bandwidth, a connectivity issues most likely, a huge bottleneck in this server. You can try to distribute that to edge hardware. There are different types of edge hardware. Raspberry Pi might not be enough for you, your solution if your model is a bit too complex. Then you can actually try to um, just use attention mechanisms. I'm not going to get into the details of that right now. Uh, at the edge and have actually um, what I like to call for computing. This is stolen from Intel, where you actually have on-premise servers, most likely closer to the cameras, but not a huge bottleneck. You can use NVIDIA devices. I highly recommend this uh, on many, many occasions. Uh, so that's basically a mini GPU that you can actually have close to the cameras. You can have accelerators for that. Uh, or you can actually have an architecture where you just send everything to the cloud with, a tool, with that landing lens and avoid all of the hassles of setting all of those things up. Uh, remember, if you're actually going for uh, some of the solutions I just presented, you might need to do an upfront investment of buying a lot of hardware with tools like Tendingless. You can actually just pay per use many of these things. So there are many advantages there. And lastly, some takeaways. Um, some of these problems, you can actually create some virtuous cycles. So with enough data uh, and quality of the data, you can build an amazing product with that. You can get users and users give you more data. So if you're trying to build something like this, 
it starts with the data and you can actually just keep on going on a niche. And uh, just an excellent example of this is Blue River, who actually started by taking pictures of plants and they just basically went to the camp and to, to the countryside and, and, and took those. They finally got acquired by over 300 million. I think this is an excellent use case. I love to get into the details of that, but I want to uh, leave enough time for the Q&A. Some takeaways. Um, despite progress made and models being released, some problems remain really, really hard to solve. I think this is one of them and require in-depth analysis and thoughtful design. This is where you need experts. Complex detail problems like shelf protection, this is what we've been talking about, can be automated um, and we have um, and we can improve the existing baselines. This is basically humans counting all of this. And tools like landing aid or companies like us can help reduce the time to market significantly because we have experience doing these things. And there are many surprises that you'll find that you'll face if you try to do this by yourself. And with that, we'll leave 15 minutes for the Q&A. Um, thank you very much for your, your attention so far. I, I really, really hope that I actually didn't went too fast over all of the solutions. Um, I'm Rodrigo, going to the thank, thank, you, my, thank you, my friend. That was an excellent presentation. Let's uh, open it for questions from the audience. So we have a number of questions. Would you like me to read the start in order, Carl? Uh, Sounds good. Prefer. Yeah. Okay. Let me start with the first one. How will you address if you need to identify a product from top view and the lids are almost the same? Is there a way to do it? Perfect. Um, I'm going to perhaps go to one of the examples. As I was actually saying, uh, it's really, really hard to do. You need information. If the lid has enough information for you to do that, then you can. Otherwise, you can't. Um, on occasions, you can't solve all of the problems. And just to illustrate the point that I think the, the, this person is actually trying to say, let's suppose that we're actually seeing these shampoos from the top lid and we're just in the blue part. It's impossible to, to say that these are actually different SKUs. You just say that this is head and shoulders. Excellent. Did you want to add anything else to that before I go on to the next question? Yeah, we can go on. Okay. How do you count items placed behind the front row? Um, again, I try to answer this. Um, if you have, if you can see them, you can count them. If you can't see them, then you basically don't have enough information. It's not like you have a sonar here that can actually do another type of analysis of the of the information. You just have a 2D image. Uh, it's impossible to see what you don't see in that image. Great. Next one. How do you OCR on metal parts that have the letters wrote on them? Those most of the time are not easy to read, even for a human eye. Perfect. And I think the comparison is great. Um, if the human can read this, then it might be feasible for the computer to read this. If the human can't read this, then perhaps the computer might actually fail doing the same task. Um, I think it's not from this particular situation, but other occasions where we need to use OCR. And uh, there are many tweaks you can try to use uh, doing some feature engineering, basically trying to highlight some of the features in the image, um, some basic transformations, try, try black over white or white over black, try to enhance the edges of the solution of, of the image and stuff like that. And um, it will be great to take a look at those pictures. We can do that right now, but feel free to reach out and we'll try to help you with that. Excellent, thank you. How easily is it to connect this AI to another system? Perfect, so I try to talk about end-to-end -end pipelines and end-to-end -end pipelines on many occasions need integrations with other stuff. In our particular case, we actually ended up connecting to an API from our clients so as to store everything in that API. Um, if you think this through, um, you won't have many issues connecting this with other systems. Um, 
it's impossible to add business value if you just create something that's an island and you con don't connect that to anything. Um, I'm referring to an AI, this AI in the question, to the end-to-end -end pipeline and not just the model. The model needs a wrapper, needs that error correction I was also talking about, the ROI detection, and many, many other things. So it's really easier than in than it might actually look like. Excellent. Would it make sense to start requesting an image data set of products from each brand so that you can use it for training a detection algorithm? Uh, someone actually, hold on for one second, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, I get the question. Uh, I Great. tried to explain this. Um, yes, that's a really good starting point, but the problem is that the brands will actually send you most likely images taken by photographers. And those have different like conditions. Those are not occluded. Those are not on the side. So it is a starting point that can actually help with this Siamese Networks approach I was actually trying to explain but it will most likely not be enough because for training you need data that's um, equivalent to what you expect in production and in production uh, photographers won't do some photoshop on the on the product and when asking these brands they most likely do that great <clears throat> next question how do you prevent the misprediction caused by customers placing products randomly Excellent question. Um, you're going to have some level of error in all of this. Um, to be honest, there are many, many things that worry me more than this. We didn't see that too much in the, in the data sets we need to build for this. Um, you're going to have mispredictions uh, regardless of how good the solution is. Um, that's not the main source of error in our experience. Um, you can try to do some error correction with the neighbors on many, many occasions. You don't just find a single product that's uh, without a similar product nearby. So you have a, a bunch of shampoos together, you have a bunch of Cokes together, a bunch of coffees together. Uh, it's really hard to have a Coke inside coffees and you can try to correct that. Excellent, thank you for that. If a client requests access to do changes on the product <clears throat> or if they would like to include or exclude some products, will you provide access or is it a black box product? Perfect. Um, a little bit more of what Marvic offers to the market. We offer custom solutions, custom end-to-end -end solutions. So whenever we have a client, we, de we develop an algorithm that's tailored for them. So if you want to tackle this problem with us, we'll basically give you as much flexibility as we can from the technical point of view. This is not a black box product that you just buy plug and play. We'll adapt this to whatever you need. We'll connect this to your systems. We'll also comply with whatever business rules you have on your end that might not be as straightforward to actually take from one client to the other. Great, thank you. Next one, what type of cameras are required for this? Can I use a camera with a microscopic lens to detect small particles or separation between assembled parts? I think this might be a bit more oriented to landing lens tool. Um, I can let Carl take this if he wants, but computer vision algorithms don't require any specific cameras. Um, you can treat many different sorts of images, even things that are actually not taken by cameras. You can even uh, use some sort of um, algorithm to try to take voice into, into a 2D space. And with that, you can actually use some of the same solutions. A short answer, yes, you can use those cameras. I'm sure, Carl, if you want to complement with anything. Yeah, thanks, Rodrigo. So one of the strengths of learning AI is that we're hardware agnostic and we've, we've deployed uh, projects with lots of different um, imaging uh, hardware. So generally the best practice is that we recommend at least 10 pixels across the size of the smallest uh, object or uh, defect that um, clients wish to detect. 
Uh, so that means selecting the appropriate field of view, um, make sure there's enough pixels across those individual defects to reliably and robustly um, detect those kinds of defects every time. So yes, definitely possible. Excellent, thank you for that, Carl. Um, and I'll open it up to either I, either of you two to answer this one. For retailers interested in adopting computer vision technology, what are the initial steps they should take? Um, Carl, do you want me to take this or do you want to go? Go ahead, go ahead. I think the, the really important thing that we need to get right from the get-go is to try to find people to help you with that that are knowledgeable about this. Um, it's really important even to hire someone. It can be in-house or outsourced. Um, try to get an expert consultation or whatever you guys like, but try to get some guidance uh, to try to define a good problem. It's always great to find a, a quick win to actually gain more approval inside the company on many occasions. Um, try to get someone who knows about using AI uh, help you. Otherwise, uh, you're most likely going to pass a lot and most likely fail on many things because we all need to learn uh, from this. It's not easy to actually deploy these solutions. These are actually not traditional software solutions. Um, the risk involved in the project, the prerequisites, uh, you need to build a data set, you need to understand how to do that. So get help. That's my advice on this. Excellent, thank you, Rodrigo. Next one, is real-time application and computer vision feasible for product repositioning in retail stores? Yes, totally. Um, processing one of these images doesn't take that much time and it's going to be way faster than the time to actually replace the product on the shelf. Uh, real time in these applications can be seconds. You can even take up minutes and that's really not a problem for this industry. It's a huge problem if we're talking about autonomous vehicles where you're actually driving at high speeds over the highway. Uh, in this problem, uh, yeah, it's totally feasible. Excellent. And the next question, what are the software capabilities within the framework of OCR in identifying brand letters? In some exercises conducted, it can differentiate labels very easily. Was it intended that way or just achieved? Perfect. So OCR models are not necessarily the same as label detection models. With OCR, you're trying to detect basically text. Um, some of these brands have specific fonts and it's easier to try to get those with a label detection model versus an OCR because on occasion it's really hard to read these fonts. Especially, uh, I keep drawing your attention to the small amount of pixels we cover in some of these images. Many occasions, it's really hard to tell those apart. Um, perhaps I can actually show the coffee image and look for that. Yeah, here. Uh, many occasions, you can't detect that. Uh, you can, for example, have diagonals like this. Uh, the Kellogg's here, it's really hard to read for an OCR model. It's going to make a lot of mistakes, most likely. Um, so you're most likely be talking about two different models for those two different tasks. And software capabilities, um, I'm not sure if that's oriented to actually um, what you need to integrate this with, what tools you need, or if it was a performance question, perhaps the user can clarify that. If the user would like to raise their hand, we'll go ahead and answer that question live. And let me cover a couple of other ones just to make sure we did um, get them. Bear with me. We only have about one minute left here. I'm actually going to take one of these. Um, let's see, where was it here? Is the output of the system going to be which item is now out of stock, i.e. which item is now empty on the shelf? If so, how does a model know what product and empty space was, thanks. Perfect, uh, I think we covered the missing items uh, with those bonding bo boxes, the black one in particular, find the width 
for what uh, missing item. And we also need to connect that with the planogram compliance. So you need to know what to expect in each of the shelves so as to know that something is really missing. Because with images, you know what you have, you don't know what you are actually missing. You need that information from elsewhere. On many occasions, that's something connected to a different system as some of the other uh, persons were actually asking about. Excellent. We're at time, top of the hour. Rodrigo, Carl, thank you. Rodrigo, thank you for your excellent presentation, your knowledge, sharing all the great things that you are doing with Marvic and your customer base. To everyone that attended, we will post this and follow up with an email tomorrow. Thank you for your great questions. We host weekly webinars. I'll, we'll have a link in our email with the upcoming events to the end of October and November. Again, thank you so much. We hope this was a valuable opportunity and session to learn about computer vision in retail transformation for AI. Have a great day. We're at the end now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure.